Hello, travelers. Welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens through virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you're joining us for today's live stream event. What lies in the darkest, most remote depths of our oceans? How can we use incredible underwater robotics and technology to explore these places that inspire so much curiosity? Those are the questions at the center of Reach the World's virtual exchange expedition with members of the Ocean Infinity team. Today, we're talking with AUV Superintendent Chad Bonin. Chad is an experienced AUV operator and mission planner, and he's going to be answering all our questions about the use of AUVs primarily, but also ROVs at sea. If you haven't already read Chad's article about his work with AUVs, we'll add the link in the chat bar on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're just joining us and want to reserve your classroom's place for the duration of this virtual exchange expedition, we'll also add the registration link to the chat bar. I want to give a special welcome to the teachers and students who are joining us live today. Please feel free to use the YouTube chat bar. Let us know you're here, where you're joining from, and of course, to share any questions you have with Chad as we go. We'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 30 minutes or so. So without any further delay, it's time to unlock the ocean secrets. Chad, welcome to Reach the World. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. It's great to have you here with us today. Um, we have lots of students who are excited to hear and learn more about AUVs and the use of marine robotics uh, at sea. I thought maybe you could start by just telling us how you became interested in this field and, and what your career path to now has been. So, yeah, so I was, uh, you know, out of high school and, and into the oil field in Louisiana, starting out with offshore surveying and just, uh, you know, had a big interest in the technology. And then as the years have gone by, you know, technology is becoming much more advanced and components are becoming smaller so that you can add them to a system like an AUV, you know. So it's just the, the technology. That's what's really it holds my attention with this is that we, we, we deal with some of the, the newest technology that comes out every day. All right. Very good. So when you were maybe just graduating from high school, like how did you, how do you start into this life of, of offshore work and working on, on water? Well, in, in, in the state of Louisiana, that's pretty much, you know, you, you, you either, go to college or you go to work. So it was, I started out offshore pretty early in life. And uh, so I started with the, you know, like I said, uh, uh, offshore surveying and just moved on from there and it just kept going, you know, we'd go deeper and deeper into the ocean, so. Okay. So when you say surveying, what do you mean? What is, what is ocean surveying? Yeah, so initially we started with, you know, laying pipelines, moving drilling rigs and things like that all. Uh, on and off a location. And then from there, we did a lot of, you know, bathymetry surveys, seabed mapping and things like that. All right, very good. Um, we are talking today specifically about AUVs. Can you tell us what AUV stands for and just basically what is an AUV? Yeah, so AUV is Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. And it's, uh, it has, the capability to dive down to uh, up to 6,000 meters of water. And it has the uh, side scan sonar on each, on a port and starboard side, and then a multi-beam sensor that fills in the gap between the side scans. And with that, we're able to scan the ocean uh, sea, seabed, and from there, collect that data and create 3D models of the seabed. Okay, I, from your article that you just published, your wonderful article that, that you just published to the Reach the World um, site, which we'll put a link in the chat uh, for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, the pictures of the AUVs that you show look kind of like a torpedo. Are, do, all, do all AUVs look that way? Yeah, most of them are. I mean, the same general shape, but yeah, the ones that we use, uh, that's, that's the best way to describe them. I, I've described it to a lot of different people. Just think of a torpedo. Uh, with a bunch of sonar sensors on them. Okay. And the, the autonomous part of AUV means that they're not connected to anything, right? They can just sort of go where they want to go. 
Well, that's correct. Um, so what we do is um, it's not connected to the vessel. So what we do is we create a mission plan. Uh, we have a pre-dive checklist that we go through similar to like an airplane takeoff. You know, the pilot has to do a check off, a checklist. And then what we do is in the computer system, we create a mission plan that gives it specific lines uh, built with uh, point coordinates. And the AUV, once we load that into the AUV, it knows that, okay, I have to follow this specific line, this specific waypoint. So it's uh, once we... Once we launch the AUV, it'll, it'll ride on surface for a little while, then it'll dive down, and then it starts reading its mission plan through the computer system. And each mission plan, each line has a point coordinate, right? So then it starts traveling to that point coordinate, and it continues the mission where we do not have to be there 100% of the time to supervise it. So if we launch one, we can send it down, make sure it's on its mission, and then send it on its way to go to a new location and launch a second one. And then eventually we come back and check on them, you know, throughout their missions. But uh, yeah, so they, they, they actually follow the whole mission plan without any uh, supervision. That's where your autonomous part comes into play. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, once you launch an AUV, how long can it be out mapping for before it needs to come back to you? So we have, um, Two battery systems, well, the ones, the one battery system will get it on to, we've, we've 55 or 56 hours per mission. Uh, we have a second battery system that we've invested in and they have, I haven't personally worked with it, but uh, my colleague Seth that you previously uh, had the interview with, I believe they were up to 93 or 94 hours per mission. So wow. yeah, that's quite a long time. It seems like really the perfect tool to do some serious mapping of the ocean floor, of which we know so little about. These really deep, inaccessible, cold, dark corners of the ocean that we really have no idea what's down there. This AUV tool is specifically designed to show us what's there, right? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, actually, we know more about Mars than we do the deepest parts of our oceans, you know, which right here on this Earth. So yeah, the, our, our AUVs, like I said, they have a, uh, you know, the deepest part I've ever, in the, on a dive that I've completed with an AUV was 5,800 meters, which is 19,000 feet. You know, so that's, it's pretty deep for the ocean, you know, and, and so we're able to map that and create 3D models. And, uh, you know, so we can do this, you know, um, you know create the 3D models and have that for, for better research and an idea of what we have below the, the seabed. What kind of concerns do you have about the AUVs when you're mapping that deeply? Like what factors are putting pressure on the AUV or do you, can you send it deeper or like what prevents you from, from going deeper than that? Well, yeah, the, the pressure, you know, the atmospheric pressure at, at that depth. Um, so a lot of the sensors and components on the AUV are rated to 6,000 meters. So that's the deepest, uh, you know, I haven't personally been at 6,000 with an AUV. Uh, we have, some of our colleagues have, but um, it's the, the pressure that the, 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 you know, basically the water above is pushing down, the force that's pushing down on the components. Um, uh, a lot, you know, all of the sensors that are on the AUV are rated down to 6,000 meters also. So anything outside of that uh, or deeper than that, there's a possibility of crushing the sensors, you know. So that's, that's one, one factor. Um, another one, that kind of depth, uh, and you're looking at the, uh, the seafloor, right? So the seafloor is not always flat. So there's a lot of, lot of terrain that the AUV has to go uh, up, above, down. And so we worry about, you know, when we're when in that kind of depth of water, we try to supervise as much as possible um, just to keep an eye on it um, because there will be times that it might not be able to make the, 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 you know, to pass over a certain terrain and then it'll come into an emergency ascent situation. Uh, so we want to be able to monitor that as much as possible. So that's, 
as a, as a, when you get that deep, there, there's a lot more factors that come into it that you really have to think about before you send that AUV down and, you know, into that depth. Well, well, the AUV is, is off on its mission. Are you getting live images of what it's picking up or do you need to wait till it comes back to the ship to deliver that data to you? No, unfortunately, you have to uh, wait for the data, you know, the AUV to come back so we can download the data. And then uh, we can see that either the camera missions or the, uh, we have to process the data to see the 3D images. So. Okay, so you alluded to the fact that we talked to your colleague, Seth, who showed us on one of the, the Ocean Infinity vessels, mm -hmm. Island Pride, what the control room looks wow. like on a ship. Can you talk us through what it's like to be in a control room while an AUV is out on a mission? Yeah, so and it's, it's pretty quiet in there because you, you really everybody's focused and paying attention to the AV, especially like if we are on a, on a mission that deep. Um, you have your first, you know, like I said, you start of a pre-mission checklist that we go through and we're communicating with from the online room to the guys on the deck who are doing all the checks on the AUVs. And then you go into your launch situation where you get the vessel moving. And it's, uh, you know, the communications are, it's, it's only a direct line of communication. There's no, no one standing around watching, you know, with distractions and things of that sort. So it's, uh, it, it can get intense um, when you start diving, you know, and you making sure you have that acoustic communication, which is our, uh, our sound communication through the water. Um, as long as we have, you know, the acoustic communications, everything is great. You know, we can dive it down. It's, uh, it's when you start getting to the point where you're so deep that you miss it. There's a, you know, you get a, com a communication error and then that's when it, you know, it can get intense. But for the most part in the online room, I mean, you've got experienced operators. So it, um, uh, you know, you, you have, you know, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You know, it's, you're monitoring four and five uh, computer monitors at one at one time. So we so many reach the world students remember uh, the Wood LC expedition from a couple of years ago. Um, I'm, you were describing earlier uh, how to establish acoustic, acoustic communication when you're not just floating on top of open water. That there's ice in between you yeah. and the AUV. How do you do that? How do you maintain? Uh, that connection when you have to go through ice. So, yeah, unfortunately, so, uh, you know, we were talking about earlier the, uh, the Weddell Sea, we, uh, when we were looking for our Shackleton ship, uh, the endurance we had on the mission plan, like I said, I believe it was 12 lines total mission plan. And so what we had to do was basically we put the vessel in the middle of all the you know, perpendicular of all the lines and we established communication on the first line with the AUV. So then when it, when it passed us, we were able to send it a, a position update. And then from there, we had to take the uh, Gullis, which is the ship that, in uh, the mother ship that we were on, we had to break the ice to get to the next uh, mission line and then sit and wait for the a AUV to come back so we can establish communications again. And each time we did that, you know, up to seven lines. Yeah. So I'm going to break ice every time to get to it. It's, it's just another great example of the things that AUVs allow you to do that just would not be possible with a human diver, uh, the limitations of, of humans, um, to, to be able to survey such a deep ocean floor beneath thick ice is incredible. Yeah. It makes me wonder what can't an AUV do? Is there, is there, what, what are like the limitations of AUVs? Yeah, so the limitations, I mean, you know, you were just speaking about a diver, right? So you have that for every 33 feet of water depth, you have atmospheric pressure. You have 14.6 uh, pounds of pressure per square inch that'll push against the body. So a human being can only dive so deep before the AUVs and the ROVs, the robots have to take over. Um, the AUV, it's limiting factor. I mean, it, it it's... It's more for data acquisition, um, scanning the seafloor, and uh, you know, bringing you know, we can we have to see create three D models. Um, sub bottom, we can penetrate through the the, the seabed just to see if there's any type of geology. 
uh, to a certain depth. I'm not sure exactly how deep those can go. It depends on uh, the power of the sub bottom that we turn it up. But uh, that's more so just an AUV limitation. It's for more so data acquisition. Whereas let's say we, we, we get the AUV back up and process the data and we have a point of interest that we really want to go investigate further. Well, then here comes your ROV, which has manipulators that can move. If we want to move something out of the way, the ROV can, where an AUV is, has to constantly be in motion. The ROV can be more of a stationary in vi live video camera manipulation and things like that for further investigation. Okay, great. Let's switch over to talking about ROVs real quickly. Um, are ROVs <laughs> tethered to the ship or are they off doing their own thing as well? No, well, so the, today's ROVs are still tethered to, to the ship. Um, so un, unlike an AUV, which we send it on a mission and we can actually move the ship wherever we feel like, uh, the ROV uh, limits the, the ship movement because it's tethered. And you know, depending on the depth that we're working, um, you know, there, as it gets more, the, the deeper it goes, the, the more weight that you have in the water. So that it very it limits the ship's movement quite a bit. Okay. Um, they, the ROV is a great asset because that you were asking about live stream and stuff, they can create, you know, the camera images and live stream at, at the same time. They have that line of communication back up to the ship with the, the video feed. Okay, so if you're in the, the control room when an ROV is down um, in the water, you're looking at a screen that's basically exactly what the ROV is seeing at the time. That's correct. Yep, a live video feed. That's correct. Okay. And how do you manipulate the arms of an ROV as, a, as the operator in the control room? Well, it's, it's uh, you have the, the pilot who's actually flying the, AV, uh, the ROV, sorry. And you have the, I guess, like the co-pilot, I guess you would call them. They have some controls in the ROV shack that, that would manipulate. And it looks like, a, um, I'm, I'm, I, I would say kind of a video game control type of system, right? So that they're able to sit on the side of the pilot and manipulate the, the, uh, the arms that come out at the same time. Is that a good sort of career path for someone who has great uh, hand-eye coordination and, and is, loves video games, basically? Perfect. Yes, it is. Yes. Right. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill that, that has to be learned because, I mean, these guys, with the ones that are flying, it's, uh, it's not just an easy task, but, it, but you're right. The, the ones that play a lot of video games, that, you know, that hand-eye coordination is, is number one. Yeah. All right. Great. That's a, that's a good, good, uh, good analogy there. You know, <laughs> you have over the course of your career gotten to see a lot of really cool things and go cool places. Do you have a standout favorite, just a, a place that you really enjoyed or found interesting related to the oceans? Yeah, it was definitely Antarctica. That just tops the list. You know, it was just such a beautiful, pristine area. You know, as far as you can see, it was just white. I and mean, it was, there was no uh, smog. There was nothing diluting the, uh, the, the image. You know, it was crystal clear everywhere you look. Oh, that sounds the great. Wildlife was unbelievable. The penguins, the seals, you saw the whales. All right, we have a question from the online audience uh, today. You just touched on what the coolest place you've ever explored is. Um, uh, the question that I had as well that, that this viewer would like to know is, what's the coolest thing you've ever discovered on the bottom of the ocean? Uh, well, we, you know, we, uh, with Ocean Infinity, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, searching and um, for, we ended up finding the submarine uh, in San Juan in Argentina. And also there was a submarine that we found off the coast of France. So I would say those two definitely were the coolest, you know. 
All right. What is it? I mean, just generally speaking, when you're searching for something, if you have something specific in mind that you're looking for in the ocean, and the ocean is just infinitely large, it seems, uh, to people, especially us who don't have a lot of experience on the ocean, what is it like when you, what's the feeling like when you find what you're looking for? Oh, it's the exhilaration, you know, just the one. So the initial dive with the AUVs, right? Like I said, we said before, you have to wait for it to come up to collect the data and, you know, process the data and see any imaging. It's when you, you find that target with the AUV and you do a further investigation with the ROV. And when that, that live stream, you start seeing the image that you're looking for, you know, there's a, there's an exhilaration that, that, that overwhelms the whole room with everybody watching that live, that live feed. How exciting. I mean, there's high fives going on, you know, depending <laughs> on what we're looking for and everybody's excited. It, it must also be sort of feel like sort of a privilege to be, have eyes and ears at these in this place where really nobody has ever been before. Do you get a sense of being an explorer when you are really like down in this dark, foreign world underwater most definitely it's it's intriguing because like, like you're saying you know you, we've studied mars more than we have the ocean floor and when you're able to see that uh you know on a live feed and really start you know you just you're looking at something that not many other people get to see so it really draws you in it it, it holds your attention and there's times when we're doing an rov search that you don't realize how much time has passed because you're so focused on what's, you know, that amazing screen of what's on the seafloor that you don't get to see every day, you know? Well, that sounds really cool. Um, it, it sounds also as though AUVs are very uh, environmentally friendly. They run on batteries. They can go for a long time. Like you can learn a lot about a lot of things without really having that big of an impact on the ocean itself. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, so, you know, it's, it's a battery powered system. Um, we have some oils that we use for to, to compensate for the pressure, but it's all environmentally friendly oils and things of that sort. It's all um, self-contained, but we can, we can run, like I said, the battery time, we can run and explore vast areas with an AUV and get a lot of data acquisition to be able to map the seabed, stuff like that. Uh, you know, in, even in one mission where um, so, uh, the Island Pride, which is what the one Seth is on, we have six AUVs on board there. Mm -hmm. So you really, once you have all six in the water, you're covering a big area, you know, a vast area of, of seabed to be able to map and, and create models for, for different scientists and or marine biologists to look at and things of that sort. That's incredible. You can have all six AUVs out doing separate things at the same time. That's correct. Yeah, we create missions like we want one big area. OK, so however many square miles, you know, we might do a 100 square mile area, but we'll break it up into 25 square miles each area. And then we'll launch the AUV throughout the, that whole area, each, you know, one AUV for each section and let them do their mission. And then we'll go around picking them up as they complete their missions. That is, that is just amazing. Uh, that's to me. that's where you, you really cover a lot of ground when you have a lot of AUVs in the water scanning like that. Uh, the most we've had was uh, we, we were working on in uh, the Indian Ocean. This was uh, in 2017, I believe, where we were looking for MH370, the airplane that went down. And at one time, we had eight AUVs in the water at one time scanning the seabed. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, you have so much experience with AUVs. I'm sure over the course of your career so far, you've seen this technology sort of evolve in, in interesting ways and become more complex. Uh, what is it that you see as, as coming up next? What excites you about the future of, of AUVs? Yeah, so what we're seeing here, I, I've been seeing it you know, on, on websites and, and you know, reading in a couple of different uh, magazines, subsea magazines that they're starting to incorporate an AUV and ROV into one unit. So that's going to, um, that's going to propel the industry there. I mean, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot more that we can do 
with that system because it's it's an all-in-one system and that makes the rov not have to be tethered to the ship so there goes that you take away that limiting factor for an rov so i, I see that 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 technology is coming in pretty soon uh, you know as far as what i can uh, what i've been reading in articles so that's going to be interesting to see in the future is it possible to send live data from an ROV or AUV without it being connected to the ship? Um, right now, no. Um, as far as you know, as far as I know, the ROV has to be connected for the live stream. But that is what they're working on with the the com the, the compound unit, which is the ROV AUV in one. So that. That is one of the technologies that are, they are working on for that to send the data, you know, the, all the data through the water column through the sound. Well, that's very exciting. Um, if you could go sort of, let's set Antarctica aside for a second. If you could go and explore some other part of the world, do you have, do you have a place that you haven't been to yet that you'd love to go and, and check out someday? Alaska. Off the, at the coast of Alaska and, uh, you know, just to, just to see first the beautiful terrain up there, but then see how the, uh, you know, the, the icebergs and everything, you know, the, the, what they do, you know, to the seabed up there. And just, you know, that's a lot of areas that are, are uncharted and undiscovered because it's, it's frozen over a lot also. So I would say definitely, definitely Alaska, that okay. area. We have a lot of students who are very interested in exploration and interested in marine robotics. Um, what advice would you have for students who hear what you're saying and think that just sounds like the coolest job in the whole world? What would you say they should study? What would you say they should pursue if they want to be like you someday? You know, one of the coolest ones, I, I, you know, working with the, the, the students, um, in Antarctica, I would say marine biology, and then uh, there's there's an ocean technology degree that you would uh, want to look into. That is a great one to to get started in this industry. All right, very good. Um, well, I think we've covered almost everything I can think of in terms of AUVs and ROVs. Um, it's such an exciting uh, world. Uh, it's so cool to hear about what you're doing and to have this information about AUVs and ROVs in the context of the greater project of exploring our world's oceans and uncovering all the mysteries that remain at the bottom of our ocean. <laughs> um, so Chad, I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a really fun conversation. Uh, I learned a lot. I know our students have learned a lot. Um, and I want to thank our entire on-camera and YouTube live stream audiences for some of the questions they submitted. Uh, we have more Ocean Infinity special guests to come in the coming weeks. We're going to be talking about um, Armada, the completely... Um, it's going to be interesting. Autonomous ships that are, are off exploring or about to be off exploring the oceans, which is very exciting. Um, and we're going to cover a bunch more over, over the course of the next couple of weeks. So make sure you don't miss a single article or video call. And for a complete listing of upcoming Reach the World events, you can visit at home.reachtheworld.org. Chad, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Have a good one.